On this week's episode of What the Ship, the Black Sea Grain Initiative has been extended for 60 days. Tanker companies sprout from nowhere to transport Russian oil. The Port of Los Angeles sees a huge 43% cargo drop. Container alliances adapt to new cargo levels. And international inspectors put the worst flags in their crosshair. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercaglano, and welcome to this week's What the Ship. So, a lot to cover to give you the insight of what is happening on the world's oceans. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you learn about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our five stories. Story number one takes us to the Black Sea and the renewal of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, or I should say an extension. So the agreement allowing Ukraine to transport crops, and uh, when I mean crops, I'm talking about wheat, corn, barley, grain of all types, out has been renewed, renewed for another four months. And this agreement has been brokered by the United Nations, Turkey, between Ukraine and Russia. Now, so far, this agreement has allowed the export of about 24 million tons of grain out of the Ukraine. And that has been going on since July of last year. And this agreement is really essential for the safe movement. Uh, this basically allows ships to get cleared in a port of Istanbul in Turkey and then sail through a designated corridor up to Ukraine, one of three ports, load Ukrainian grain, and then sail back out clear of any potential hit or attack by the Russians. At the same time, the Ukrainians agreed to allow Russian grain and food and fuel to move unimpeded through the Black Sea. And this initiative has been going on for a while, as we see here. A total of 24 million tons of cargo has moved. The large majority of it, 50% of it, is corn, another quarter wheat, and the rest is divided among sunflower oil, sunflower meal, barley, and such. The agreement has huge ramifications and a lot of attention has been associated with it. This grain is going to a variety of different countries. I linked over to the UN site where you can see exactly where the grain's going uh, to countries like China, to Turkey, to Spain, to Italy, to the Netherlands. And a lot of that grain is then transported to other places. For example, Turkey turns uh, produces 40% of the world's flour. So it's really essential that this keeps moving. The question is the long-term viability of the Ukraine grain deal. This Black Sea Grain Initiative is really important, but the problem is Ukraine's going to see a diminishing amount of grain coming out of it, largely because of the war and the impact it's been having on the ability of the Ukrainians to get into fields and basically farm. Uh, you know that Ukrainians have been diverted to the battlefront, fields have been damaged, uh, equipment has been damaged, and most importantly, even with the Black Sea Grain Initiative, the amount of food coming out in grain is not the same as it was pre-war. And the question here is who can last longer in this economic part of war? And many wars are decided not on the battlefront, but on the home front. And this may be the case right here. If Ukraine cannot get its crops to marketplace, it cannot get in the fields, cannot harvest, and cannot get them out, that may be the thing that drives Ukraine out of the war because of an economic collapse. While many people are giving Ukraine aid, military, and other weapons, they're also giving financial aid. But the question is, how long does that financial aid go? Whereas other countries will sit there and say, hey, we've got issues in our own country. So good news about the renewal. It's only 60 days. It's not 120 days. They were hoping for 120 days. They got 60 days. And so that means in two months from now, we'll be back in the same position again. All right, let's jump over to story number two. Story number two also deals with Russia, Ukraine, but this time it's the movement of Russian oil. This is a Bloomberg story over a G captain. Tanker giants sprout from nowhere to keep Russian oil moving. And this story has a great intro by Elizabeth Lowe. At a downtown office block in Mumbai, parking tape peels off a black door whose handle appears to have been ripped out. A pile of post is strewn on the floor outside. A guy from neighboring office says the staff moved out weeks ago, destination unknown. About 1,200 miles away in Dubai, a small office in a rundown industrial estate offers no clues that it too is a small cog in Russia's vast new petroleum supply chain. The two locations are listed 
on an international maritime database as belonging to firms running $2 billion in tanker assets between them. The assembled fleet is under a year that, uh, in under a year that are now delivering millions of barrels of Russian oil around the globe. The first address is for a firm called Gaddock Ship Management in Mumbai. The second is for Fractal Shipping. They're part of a sprawling network of maritime operations. And if you see in the chart down there, you get the scale of these two companies. Gaddock Ship Management has 50 ships valued valued at $1.4 billion. Fractal Marine, 26 ships valued at $631 million. Okay, this is not new in shipping, let me be clear. But having, you know, basically mailing addresses in countries and going through basically shell companies is as old as anything when it comes to oil tankers, especially oil tankers. Uh, this has a lot to do with oil spills and uh, damages done by vessels like Amico Cadiz and Exxon Valdez. Uh, back in the day when the big seven sisters ran most of the world's tanker companies, they thought it was a great idea to put their name on the side of their tankers. That is until they ran aground and started spilling oil everywhere. And then people protested by not going to Amoco gas stations or Exxon gas stations. And more importantly, it exposed the companies to billions of dollars of liability. And so now what you see is shell companies after shell companies with tankers uh, associated with them so that when you sue the company, you get to basically nothing. There's no assets at the end of them. And so what the Russians are doing is basically taking what the West has developed in Russian ta in, in tankers and applying it to them. The other element here is Russia is seeking shipping insurance recognition to dodge oil cap. So the whole purpose, sorry, Maui in the background there, the whole purpose of the price cap was to force Russia to keep selling oil, but below a threshold, $60 per barrel. And the mechanism they're using to enforce that is the p &I insurance clubs, the 13 big p &I insurance clubs of the International p and uh, Association. Well, Russia is getting around that by creating their own p &I clubs. We're seeing p &I clubs set up in Russia, in China, in India, in the Middle East. And so what Russia is trying to do is seek recognition for their insurance company. This works until something happens, in which case if the Russian insurance doesn't pay out a claim, then companies and countries may not allow oil to be transported into the country or firms may not buy the oil if this is the insurance attached to it. So what you're seeing here is a mechanism in place to get Russian oil to move. It's very shaky until it's tested, unfortunately. And unfortunately, to test it means something usually has to go wrong. We go on here, we see the Russian shadow fleet emerging. And again, this is a story from last month, but it's a great story because one of the things it shows is the data associated with this. This is from Bloomberg. It is showing the number of empty fuel tankers without destinations. And ships without destinations is a good idea that they belong to this dark fleet, that they may be preparing to hauling Russian oil. And so your AIS, your automated information system, your world tracker that you use, can't, you know, it's basically working by you feeding data into it. If you don't put a destination in there, then you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to put it in there. As a matter of fact, we see some cases here where AIS is turned off. It's spoofed. The ships are not where they're supposed to be. And all this goes into the Russian ability here to move oil. Remember, Russia has to keep this oil moving. They have to because of the money that it brings in to shore up the Russian economy. And again, go back to the Ukrainian Black Sea Grain Initiative deal. This is a economic war. I know we keep talking about land war and we keep talking about the air war and drones and the Black Sea and naval elements. But in truth, this is an economic war. And the question is going to be which economy holds the longest. The Russians have the bigger economy, but they also have more people and more issues with their economy. And as we see in almost all peer-to-peer -peer conflicts between nations, unless you get a decisive military victory early on, this is the reason why Russia tried to blitzkrieg their way to Kiev early in the war, and you get yourself into an attrition war, the question becomes which country has the sounder economic basis? And that's what we're seeing happening right now in the Black Sea between Russia and Ukraine. All right, let's go to story number three. 
Story number three takes us to containers and more importantly, the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. This story by Mike Schuller over in G Captain. The port of Los Angeles sees a huge 43% cargo drop. That means they handled a grand total of 487,846 TEUs, 20-foot equivalent unions in February, a staggering 43% drop from February 22, and the worst since 2009, and that is before, I mean, this is after the 2008 uh, economic recession. Uh, some quotes here by Gene Soroka. February declines were exasperated by an overall slowdown in global trade, extended Lunar New Year holiday closures in Asia, overstocked warehouses, and a shift away from West Coast ports. While we expect more cargo crossing our dock in March, volume will likely remain lighter than average in the first half of 2023. It uh, goes on here to say, we're using the volume lull to focus on new data and infrastructure initiatives to improve efficiency and preparations for increased throughput. All right, well, let's be clear about something. I've been hard on the Port of Los Angeles for a long time and on Gene Soroka, the executive director. Gene Soroka is a brilliant man when it comes to the operations of containers. The man probably, there's very few who has the knowledge that Gene has. Same thing with Mario Cadero over at Long Beach, who was a former chairman of the Federal Maritime Commission. These are two people who are very skilled, but let's talk a little bit about LA and Long Beach. Number one, they are run by local administrations. So they're local. They're literally city of Los Angeles, city of Long Beach. But they operate ports that are tenant-based. In other words, they basically lease out the space to uh, tenants, meaning they have very little control over the tenants that are in there. And so what that means is during the height of the container crisis, for example, they did very little to control their tenants over booking their cargo space. In other words, why do we have 109 ships lined up off LA and Long Beach? If you run a business and you overbook, what's going to happen in the future? And that's exactly what happened to the ports of LA and Long Beach. They overbooked. The tenants booked as much cargo as they could get in there beyond their capacity to handle it. And again, there was very little that Gene or Mario can do about that because they had no control over the tenants that were in there. And so therefore you saw the ports kind of grind down. Add to it, you had issues with break-ins along the Alameda Corridor on the rail lines. You have labor issues right now because again, we're still at a point where at the end of June of last year, the contract between the International Longshore Warehouse Union and the Pacific Maritime Association has expired. And there's no agreement in place, which means there's a continual fear that disruptions and slowdowns could happen. You have class one railway issues. You have warehouse issues. You have the fact that two thirds of the containers that come in to LA don't end up in LA. They go eastward. They go literally halfway across the country to the eastern part of the United States. Add to it, you have companies now that are advertising routes through the Panama Canal, the new lane of the Panama Canal, the Neo Panamax lane. You have new vessels that can handle that. So instead of 4,000, 5,000 TEU ships, you have 14 to 16,000 TEU ships. You have ultra large container ships that can take containers from Asia to Europe and transload them into smaller vessels and feed the East and Gulf Coast of the United States. And understand, people are willing to shift cargo over to those longer routes pay a little bit more for the reliability. Remember, they were paying $20,000 per container to get across the Pacific. Now you're down to $1,000. And if you're paying $2,000 to go the, the, the route either through the Panama Canal or on the ultra-large container ships, you're willing to pay that. Inflation is up, goods are more, but the reliability and the fact that you can land your cargo on the East Coast and put it on a truck and get to your new distribution warehouses and then feed the population that is east of a line of North Dakota to Texas is a lot more enticing than have to go into LA and Long Beach, worry about a labor disruption, worry about LA laws, California laws, worry about a class one railway issue, all that comes out. And that is backed by the way, by the evidence that we see here. This is the report by Greg Miller over on Freight Waves. I wanted to include it because he had some great charts here that show you this. So the light blue line is Long Beach. You see it down there kind of trending toward the bottom. The red line is Los Angeles. For the first half of 2022, Los Angeles had a record year, a record year. And then midway through, right when the, right when the labor negotiations was hitting, 
it dropped off and kicked back a little bit for the end of the holiday season, but then has really fallen off a cliff and now is lower than Long Beach. And the dark blue line is the port of New York and New Jersey, which was just under LA for the most uh, volume in 2022. They were just under just a few thousand containers under it. And what you see is the port of New York, for example, New York, New Jersey has kicked back up. They are on an upward uh, swing, much like the port of Long Beach was, whereas LA is on this downward swing. And if you look at the combined monthly imports for LA and Long Beach, you see they are literally having their worst year since 2020. Come over here, is container shipping rate erosion over? The big question, have we seen container rates dip to their lowest level? This story by Mike Wackett over at Lodestar out on G-Captain kind of deals about it. the average spot rate from Asian and North Europe seems to be settling around 1450 to 1550 per FEU, 40 foot equivalent union. And for Mediterranean ports, Drury is showing a fall of 1% for an average spot rate of 2,256%. If you look at the Trans-Pacific, you're looking at about $1,000 per 40 foot container. The Fredo's Baltic Instinct Index is slightly down this week, 1,030, whereas the FBX East Coast component is down by 2% to 2,215. So it is twice as much. It, it's about 50 to 100% more to ship to the U.S. East Coast than it is to the West Coast. But again, it's the reliability issue. If you can guarantee getting that container on dock, off the vessel, out of the terminal, on time, you don't have to worry about laws and, and issues with California, with the ports of LA and Long Beach, with class one railways, then you're going to do that. And again, it's proven by the evidence right here. This just came out this week, the port of Los Angeles, Tokyo, and Yokohama to establish a green shipping corridor. Now, LA has announced this already with Shanghai and a few other ports. What they want to do, and this agreement talks about it, and it's buried right here at the very end of the statement. We applaud the newest collaboration between California and Japan to clean up our ports and end ship pollution. And we urge that their collaboration focus on driving immediate emissions reductions, scaling absolute zero well to wake emissions technology and ultimately achieving 100% zero emission shipping by 2040. Understand the goal set out by the International Maritime Organization for 2050 is a 50% reduction by 2050. That is based on 2008 levels. They, the Port of LA, wants to go to zero emissions by 2040. So it is a 100% greater increase and doing it in 10 years less. Again, what you're, t and listen, let me be clear. I, I am all for cleaner shipping and less emissions. I'm all for that. I'm 100% for that. But let's be clear about a couple of things. Ships are the largest objects ever made by humans. Uh, they are on a scale not before seen, these vessels. We can't do this with cars, trucks, planes, and we want to do it with ships. Let me be clear. We can go green on ships tomorrow. They're called sailboats. The problem is you can't haul 15,000 TEUs on a sailboat. That doesn't work unless you have 15,000 sailboats and you put one TEU on each. Uh, this is not going to work. And when um, statements like this are put out, I don't think it really entices people to go to the port knowing that there is a timeline here for when you're going to have to shift over to a new and, and probably more expensive method of propulsion. And again, I, I, I don't know how they achieve that yet. It's great to have ambition. It's great to do this. But this is a detriment to the ports of LA to do this. And it's demonstrated, again, by the evidence. Here's this report from Freightways. February is still busy for Georgia ports, despite year-over-year -year sequential dips. The Georgia Port Authority says market share among U.S. ports has grown. And so you're seeing growth. You're seeing growth in ports. It's just not on the West Coast. It's over on the East Coast. It's in Savannah. It's in New York, New Jersey. It is in Houston and new ports that are developing and rapidly coming up in the United States. Remember, the biggest issue that happened during the global su supply chain crisis wasn't as much the huge spike 
in shipping rates, it was the drop in reliability. Companies went from 70 to 80% reliability down to 20, 30%. And that was the problem that everybody had and almost everybody was funneling into LA and Long Beach because again, LA and Long Beach handled over 50% of the United States containers inbound by sea. That has dropped now. And that was dropping way back in 2017 when the new lane of the Panama Canal opened. All right, let's jump over to story number four. Story number four comes also from Lodestar and Mike Wackett again uh, on G-Captain, the Alliance ships and backhaul cape diversions. All right. So one of the things that's been happening here is we're seeing a slowdown in container volumes. We're seeing, again, volumes of trade going down. So how does shipping companies and particularly these big alliances handle this? Well, one of the things that the Alliance was doing, and the Alliance is a is a makeup of, of four companies. You have ONE, which is three Japanese companies. You have HMM, you have Yang, HMM is Korean, Yang Min, which is Taiwan, and then Hapag Lloyd, which is German. So the Alliance is the smallest of the three uh, alliances out there. You have the 2M Alliance, which is Maersk and MSC, which is still in existence, goes away in 2025. And then you have the Ocean Alliance. But the Alliance was doing something very unique is the ships were sailing from Asia to Europe were going through the Suez Canal. But on the return route, they were going longer distance. They were actually going around Africa. They were avoiding the Suez Canal. And they were doing that for two reasons. Number one, the ships didn't need to come back as fast. And second, you save money. So if you look right here. Hapag has announced that the Alliance vessels deployed on the Asia-North Europe route are no longer making a 3,500 nautical mile diversion around the Cape of Good Hope. We have to have the ships for the new THEA network in place on time, said Hapag Lloyd. The new network, which was announced in December, will commence next month. Its main feature is phasing in of new build 23,500 TEU vessels to the Asia-North Europe trade and the upgrading to 14,000 to 15,000 TEUs between Asia and the Mediterranean and on the Trans-Pacific between Asia and the U.S. East Coast. The spokesman said, despite the reduction in demand, we do not plan any concrete adjustments to the network. So go on down here a little bit. Uh, moreover, despite an extra 1,000 tons of bunker fuel used, each diverted ship potentially saved the Alliance around $1 million in Suez Canal toll fees. So the Suez Canal has consistently been raising toll fees. We've seen that since Ever Given. They've been bumping them up. And matter of fact, the uh, Suez had the most busiest day ever in its history not too long ago. This resulted in a net savings of $600,000 per backhaul voyage. You have to remember, too, a lot of these ships are burning the old fuel. They're burning high sulfur diesel fuel because most of these ships have been fitted with scrubbers. That allows them to scrub the exhaust and use the older fuel, which is much cheaper than the very low sulfur diesel fuel. This works as long as you can burn the old fuel, you have scrubbers, and now most importantly, you're phasing in these new bigger ships, which give you more versatility. Understand the new bigger ships are more fuel efficient. They're also designed to carry cargo between about half load to full load. It's a big difference in how these ships have been built and designed. And we're seeing those ships come out. So here are the top 11 carriers, marine new builds by delivery year. And again, when we talk about the Alliance, we're talking about ONE, we're talking about HMM, we're talking about Yang Min, and we're talking about Hapag Lloyd. Uh, come over here to the types of vessels. This is the really interesting one. Look how many of these 13,000 to 15,000 TEU ships are coming in. That is the major number we're seeing come in. These are vessels that can go through the Suez Canal. They can go through the Panama Canal. They can be accommodated in most ports around the world. The big ultra-larges, the 23, 24,000 TEUs, they can only operate from the east coast of Asia to Europe at select major mega ports. And that plays out here in the sizes you're seeing. So the vast majority of ships you're seeing are going to be in that huge 13 to 15,000 TU 
range. I did a, a round table with Gre uh, Greg Miller and, and we were joking around the fact that we were calling these the mid range vessels. These are huge vessels. You know, a few years ago, these would be monsters and, and they are monsters. These are huge, massive ships. Uh, the below 7,000s were big ships 20 years ago. Uh, but now they're more relegated to feeder service. So again, we're coming to a point where the container companies are doing a lot. They are blank sailing, they're canceling voyages, but more importantly, they're adapting where their ships are going. They're building slack into their schedule. And one of the things we've seen with the Alliance is they built that in, but now they need the ships to phase out the old ships. There's another story out there, I should have included it, but I didn't, on the increase in the number of ships being scrapped. And we're going to see vessels heading to the scrapyard in ever larger numbers. They'll be heading to Turkey, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. So a real big change we're seeing in containers. All right, our last story is international inspectors put worst flags in their crosshairs. So I have no for ocean carriers that basically treat their crews like crap. And the International Transportation Workers Federation, seafarer unions, and port authorities in the Mediterranean are targeting a thousand ships that are flagged from four countries, Cook Islands, Palau, Sierra Leone, and Togo. These four flags of conveniences are linked to over 100 crew abandonments in the past two years and, and over 5.5 million in unpaid wages. And let me be clear. The fact that 5.5 million unpaid wages across 100 crew abandonments, that number is ridiculously low. It shows you how little they pay their crews. Uh, these flags have been responsible for over 5,200 deficiencies or detentions issued by the European Port State Control Enforcement Agency. This is the MOU that the uh, European Union has with the International Maritime Organization. So all countries around the world are in these MOUs, these Memorandum of Understandings with the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, to inspect vessels, to hold vessels to a set uh, standard. And then those flags are issued colors based on their performance. And these four are continually issues. They are continually black flagged across the board. And what you get here is this. Substandard shipping in the Mediterranean Sea is driving down seafarers' wages and conditions. It's endangering lives, risking our envi environments. These flags take money from ship owners to register ships in other countries won't touch. Many are older vessels and are poorly maintained by the owners. Many of the ships are dangerous and should not be trading. There needs to be regulation out there to phase ships out. India just recently passed a law saying they're not going to allow ships over 25 years into their country. And that is one of the first steps, I would argue, that needs to be done. The problem you have here is a lot of people want to make issues about U.S. registry, for example. I would love to see more outrage against some of these flags that are out there, abandoning crews, leaving them, and being absolute hazards on the high seas. The ITF and what's going on in the Mediterranean here with the Europeans is a good start. It should be worldwide. And we should be targeting some countries here and not allowing registries in those countries. If they want to register within their own countries, you're fine to do that. But you cannot internationally trade. We need to do a better job of ensuring that they are safe, ships out there that crews are being treated decently they're not being paid slave wages and they're not being abandoned and that has been going on for a long time i hope you enjoyed today's episode if you did take a moment subscribe to the channel hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out leave a comment share it across social media give it a thumbs up and if you can support the page how do you do that you can hit the super thanks button down below or you can head on over to patreon and become a patron of the page until our next video this is al signing off